Our sermon text for today is the Gospel lesson for the third Sunday of Advent. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Gospel concerns two people. The Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. Of these two, Jesus is the greater, being the eternal God in the flesh. John is merely his messenger, and therefore confessed before the multitude that he was unworthy to untie the Lord's sandal. Today's sermon, therefore, focuses on what the Christ teaches first about himself, and then about John the Baptist. This question is put to the Christ, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? We observe the Advent language in this question. The Christ is the coming one. Our Lord's answer indicates that he is no longer coming, but has come. He does not answer the question straight, but asks the questioner to examine the evidence for himself. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. Anyone can claim to be the Christ, but if you see someone doing the Christ's work with the power of God at his disposal, then you see and know that the Christ has come. Our faith stands on the fact that the Christ's life, his birth, his death, and his resurrection are historical events. The evangelists are passing on to us what they have seen and heard. And what they have seen is this. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. These wonders especially his true historical death and his true historical resurrection, show that Jesus is the Christ, the coming one, who has now come once and is coming again. Now the point is not the miracles themselves, but whom the miracles confess. They confess that Jesus is the Christ. He who knows the Christ has no need of the visible signs, but possesses the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and with him everlasting life. This week we mourn the physical death of a beloved brother in the Lord. Some of us are asking ourselves, why were the doctors not more diligent? Was his death not preventable? But these are foolish questions. In the end, death comes to all men. God could perform a miracle and prevent all men from dying. More than this, he could perform a miracle where all men remain in perfect health without aging or sickness and live in that ideal state until the Christ returns. God could 
give us perfect, healthy, earthly lives. So why doesn't he? Because the signs are not the point. The point is not that the blind see and the lame walk. The point is that Jesus is the one doing it. He who has Christ has true sight and true eternal life, compared with which the life of this earth is garbage. Yes, God could have given Larry more time. He could have healed his body. But the point is not earthly life, but in knowing the Christ, the coming one. Our dear brother Larry valued knowing his Lord more than this earthly life. And now he, of all people, does not regret his passing. For this very reason, the last sign is the greatest, which is, the poor have the gospel preached to them. For all other miracles of healing grant health in this life only. But the preaching of the gospel is for eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. These miracles accompanied the Christ's ministry as a testimony to his identity and a sign of his first advent. There are also signs which mark his second advent. These are the preaching of the gospel and the miracles of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Outwardly, these signs do not look like much, but they are greater miracles than healing or even of raising the dead because physical resurrection cannot forgive sins or give eternal life. But that is exactly what the sacraments promise. If it is a marvelous thing to heal the blind and raise the dead, it is an even greater marvel to forgive sins and to save from damnation. Now, if such mighty signs are happening every day in God's church, we see and know that the Christ has come and will come again. Next, the Christ warns his hearers, saying, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That is, he warns those who take offense at his works. Who would ever say it was offensive to heal the blind and the lame? And yet the Pharisees did, rebuking those whom he healed on the Sabbath. Again, who would ever say it was offensive to preach the gospel to the poor? And yet, that is the most offensive message to the kingdom of the devil. And in this way, it is possible to discern the true children of God from the children of the devil. Whoever is of God hears and gladly believes the word and works of the Christ. But whoever takes offense at his life-giving word 
must be a child of the devil. This is also true of the sacraments of the New Testament. Christ's word clearly teaches that baptism saves from death, and that the Lord's Supper is the very body and blood of the Lord for the forgiveness of sins. Whoever is offended by these is not of God, but is a false brother. Yet how many call themselves Christians, but do not believe in the regeneration of baptism? How many defile the Lord's Supper by sharing it with the unworthy, while they revile the faithful practice of closed communion as unloving? But he who trusts in the word of the Christ and cherishes his commandments is indeed blessed. For Christ's words are the words of eternal life. This, then, is what our Lord teaches about himself in this text. Jesus is the Christ the one who is coming. He came once, and he is coming again. He came the first time to preach the gospel of the forgiveness of sins by his blood. He is coming again for judgment. Whoever is not offended by the Christ's words has eternal life and will escape that final judgment. Concerning John the Baptist, the Christ teaches that he is the greatest and last of the Old Testament prophets, even as Isaiah foretold. It is sometimes mistakenly said that John was entertaining doubts in prison, and that he sent his disciples to Jesus for his own reassurance. However, this does not follow from the rest of the text. If John were doubting the faith, our Lord would not have praised him so highly, calling him more than a prophet. Why, then, does John send his disciples? and raise the question of Christ's identity. He did it for the sake of those disciples. By this time, John should not have disciples. For he confesses in John chapter 3, You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him, he must increase, but I must decrease. John's mission was to point away from himself to the Christ. Now that the Christ has come, anyone who took John's teaching seriously must abandon the prophet for the Christ. This is what the Apostle Andrew did. For he was once a disciple of John. But when his teacher pointed to the Lord Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, Andrew followed the Lord and never came back. So the reason for John's puzzling question from prison is this. John still had disciples who doubted the identity of the Christ. Therefore, he sends them to the Christ to see the signs for themselves that they might believe. In this, John the Baptist exemplifies the New Testament ministry. 
A pastor's job is to point sinners to the coming Christ. And if anyone has doubts, to show him the eyewitness accounts of the gospel and the sacraments which are signs that the Christ has come and is coming again. And if they are offended by the sacraments, we know that they are not of God's church. This, then, is what we learn about John the Baptist. That he remained faithful to his calling, even in prison. And his calling was to direct sinners to the Christ and to point out the signs that he had come. This remains the work of the New Testament ministry. To point sinners to the Christ, and to point out the signs of his coming, both his first coming to atone for sins, and his second coming for judgment. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.